page. Y'all got anything else now that we need to bring up other than our issue we discussed that we were going to back up on? No, and I'm waiting on, I've got the, um, I've got the comp plan pulled up with the maps that associate with that. Okay. And I've also got the original commission emailing us a link directly to the future land use map. I haven't gotten it yet, but okay. I've got some, I've got a map we can. But we can get a large map like that that maybe we can put up in the county so we can get a better, read, on better visual of it. Well, we're going to move back to the ULDC. As y'all recall, yesterday we we had some discussion about the ULDC and some concerns, and then we decided that we would close on that and then uh, open it back up for discussion today. So that's where we are, gentlemen. Any particular areas that you'd like to touch on? <clears throat> I'll leave it. I'll start it off with this. As you as you remember from yesterday, you have staff recommendations that was in your packet that staff has already identified as concerns that they have and issues that they'd like to see some changes in the ULDC. Um, but I think also there was some discussion about some topic areas that each one of you may have had. So. Um, we're open. Well, the staff also acknowledged that um, Highway 41 may uh, require, <coughs> um, not require, but, but is a consideration for a corridor overlay district. And I don't think we can solve that now, but I do think that we need to look closely at that and the Valdell corridor. To treat that as an overlay district? Potentially look at that as an overlay district, especially 41 with the commercial development. I mean, it doesn't even look like the same stretch of road now that it did even a few weeks ago with the development of the single carriage property. And I mean, so if y'all have been that way recently, I mean, that first little stretch there. I know that um, a group of doctors reached out to me a couple weeks ago. They're interested in the piece of property up closer to Tillman Crossing for a new health care clinic of some type that will have a surgery center in it. So, I mean, even as far up to, you know, just beyond the, where we four lane to Tillman Road, just beyond that, there's already people looking at, at commercial property there. And what I don't, what I don't want to happen is, I mean, it's happening organically or spontaneously or whatever. I just want to make sure we protect that area and keep it as attractive as we can because it is a major entry point into our community. I mean, equally as important to me as the, as the exit exchange at exit 28, I mean 22. So, you know, we get a lot of traffic coming into our community that way. And I think we need to be real careful about what those commercial structures look like. Um, I mean, I don't want necessarily just to throw this out there. I don't want to see pre-engineered metal buildings that, you know, that, that look like what the old Mineola was, acceptable, was acceptable to them years ago. So I really do think we need to look at how do we, how do we find that balance between not making it unaffordable for development, but also keep it attractive to. Yeah, typically what you would find in an overlay district, uh, it, it, it goes pretty in depth as far as um, design standards, the way the structures are built, the way the structures appear, you know, curbside appeal, those sort of things. Um, I mean, I don't have any objection if you want to start moving in that area to begin to look at that and how you think that that needs to be looked, or uh, how it needs to look. Um, we currently, as far as, um, I'm going to just call them areas, we've got a couple other overlay districts, but currently, as an example that you can work off of, is the Bemis Corner. That is already an overlay district there. For the county, so you could start by looking at those standards that's in there and see if something there would fit in either the Valdez Road um, or the 41. Because just like the discussion was going yesterday, you know, um, fortunately for us, our community, the uh, unincorporated area, is growing. Um, and fortunately, as you begin to see, we're getting more of a mix of commercial as well as residential so we need to be on the front end of addressing some of them issues then that rather than waiting so long that all of a sudden 
you then, even though you do a part or a, an overlay district, you've already had so much construction in there that you really can't tell that you've done a, a, an overlay district. So the sooner that you can do it, and the sooner you can kind of work on that, and if it's um, if that's what the wishes of the commissioners are, is that you want certain standards and certain construction types in that area, then that's what the overlay district serves. Otherwise, then it's kind of open. It's either commercial or it's residential or it's office professional, and that's it. I don't, I don't think it's too late. I mean, I wish that, that maybe we would have a little more forward thinking a couple of years ago and, and, and gone ahead and done that, but I don't think it's ever too late to, to try to do better. I mean, I know that there's a, there's a commercial operation that we just rezoned at um, Deer mm -hmm. Circle in 41. Yeah, the, the Georgia Power is doing their new, I guess that's a substation or some type of mm -hmm. transfer area right there. So right there in that area, I know there's a, co a commercial building, a large commercial building that's about to, to, um, to be developed. And I've already spoken to those guys and said, you know, look, we, we can't hold you to a new set of standards that haven't even been adopted yet, but we'd also like for you to understand that, you know, this is a key entry point in our community and we want it, we want to make it as attractive as we can can't force you to follow standards that we haven't even implemented yet, but you know, let's let's do our best at making the front of that building look as attractive as, as we can. And I and, and to, a good example is one that I personally had experience with and that comes to mind was you know St. Augustine Road in the city about Austin has an overlay district right there. And um, when Thomas Collision, the, the small building that they did several years back, um, the, the the requirement for that was simply just to have some brick or stone or, or, or architectural appeal just on the front of the building and, and wrap the sides. So I mean, I'm not I'm not proposing that we we set standards that's going to significantly increase the cost of construction or whatever for these folks. I'm just saying, let's just make it look as best we can. So, but but we can't solve that. that you mentioned on 41 single parent property. Mm -hmm. Which would you say? That was the development we approved <coughs> several years ago for a mini storage, a, a storage type. They cleared that property where the old mobile home park, the old yeah. mini old mobile home park used to be at. They're cleared it now. They're cleared it now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I don't know why there was. It seems like it's been in the works for a couple of years it now. But yeah. who is this uh, friendly filling station convenience store out there? They're from oh. over near the coast, from Brunswick or somewhere over that way. If I if I remember correctly, and they're basically coming in here, I think, directly co competing with Last Food. Yeah. Well, I, saw some, I saw some of them on the way to Savannah. That's what I'm saying. They're yeah. from that. You'll find more of them over on the East Coast. So we've got two that one off of uh, North Austin Road and over off of Brunswick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, that, that Flash Food's there at 41 and, and uh, yeah. old 41 and North Austin Road, it needed some relief. Yeah. <laughs> Busy, that That's got to be there. their best door between that one on Saint that one on Saint Augustine and Melody Lane and Saint Augustine and Garnto Road. Man, yeah, if your truck tells you you got 20 miles to empty, even if you're right down the road, don't go there because <laughs> you're gonna wait in line. To get You'll burn up that 20 miles and drive there waiting on an open tank. Crazy, they stay busy. Um, I don't know. So anyway, that for me that was. Okay. Um, I, I have a few other things that I'd like to get with Carmel on and look at, and one's accessory structures, and then the second is the, the sign ordinance stuff, and we do a better job with that and for both protection and beautification of our community, but also to make it you know, a little easier for, I think, Friendly Express fell under two different, I don't know, shouldn't speak to it because I don't have enough information. But but I know with their signs there was a there was an issue where you one, know, one was in the city, one was in the county with yeah. two different ordinances. Um, mm. going to signs, I, this is different from what you're talking about. But these little stop in the ground signs on the speak fast internet service. You see them out in the county? Everywhere out in the county. You see yeah. stuff like that. Like campaign time. signs. Yeah. Yeah. When I picked yeah. up my campaign signs last like, summer. And now we're seeing, I'm seeing uh, stuff, Bose bulldozing service. Yeah. And they're Those. fastening them to telephone poles yeah. and stuff and now, uh, out of reach. So. They're not supposed to do that. Um, 
Now here, I think the answer to that is, is that if you see one, you can let Public Works know and they will pick them up. I mean, if it's on the right of way. Now if it's on private property, somebody on that private yeah, property, right. just put there. that sign there. It's there. But if it's out on the right of way, those type signs, I mean, they're illegal to start with. They are, and yeah. what, what we can do also is I'll pass that along to code enforcement, and they can start, and we can start calling some of those people to say, hey, you just can't do well, this. Mm -hmm. And here's another one that popped up near me. Port Swings Rockers. Phone number. Jasper. Somebody's driven up here to Jasper Florida and sticking those things up. They probably, probably can't delivered a porch swing to somebody <laughs> in your community, <laughs> probably. and then that gave them the convenience yeah. of getting that sign up. But, yeah, they, they're not just getting kind of trash. I, know, I mean, I, again, I, a lot of times I use our business on a business type related, but I mean, we use we use those type signs, but we use them on private property. When you install doing, a heat and air. We install a unit. I mean, it's a marketing tool that's used on new construction sites. We'll put the sign out front. I mean, we do those things. Um, but again, our guys are instructed at the end of the day when they leave, the last thing that they do when that job's complete is to take that sign. Yeah, that's with. okay, but these others are going at, by stop signs and street signs at intersections around, and it just looks bad. The numbers of them. Well, that's just obviously they're, they're going up telephone poles, they're going up trees. They take advantage of it. So yeah, as Paige was saying, the, the best solution to that is is that when you see them, call, let call Paige or Mr. Pritchard, and they'll get code enforcement to go out there and take, take them up. Or if you're headed to the dump, just stop and pick it up yourself and go. <laughs> Because it's not supposed to be. Yeah. Some right away, it's trash. So yeah, you, that's right. You're not right away, it's property. It kind of ought to be a understood rule. Any county truck going around, if they see one, I'll forget it quick. I'm gonna I'm gonna mention something along that, and I don't know if it's something that we even want to touch on. And you talk about those signs, and of course, we talk about campaign signs. And campaign signs, every campaigning season, there's always an issue with them. I've seen candidates get upset with each other because they will accuse another one of getting their signs, when more than likely it may be code enforcement that's getting their signs because they're illegally placed. They pick those signs up. Uh, my question would be along the line with signs, would there be what do y'all think about doing, taking campaign signs, for example, and say, okay, here's a window. You can't put signs out before this date, prior to the election, and you have to have them picked up this period of time after the election, for example. I, I think that already exists. Is it already there? <laughs> okay. After election, you have so many days to move the sign. Yeah. And because we've had, uh, we've had situations where they want to raise. They were not going to be until the uh, general election, so they had to take them up and put them back out. Okay. I can check and see how early, but yeah. And if our people pick them up, they go to public works, and we keep them there until after the election. So well, we I know, but they'd like rather blame their opponent than, oh, I know. rather than. Go out there and see what our signs actually are. <laughs> go to, that means go, to, go to City Barn, go to DOT on Cypress, off, or Cedar off of Madison, and go to the County Court Barn. Mm -hmm. okay. Find your signs. So maybe it's not an issue that we need to be concerned about. Not a big problem. But I know some, uh, let me just say, there's some that's very, very good about picking up their signs when they get through campaigning, and there's some. And typically, you find that the ones that's on the that that were not successful in their campaign, they never make the effort to go back and get the signs up. When we look at the, uh, the new sign law, you have the opportunity to, as we amend this, it will you have the opportunity to add to take away. Okay. Can we look at uh, interstate billboard signs too on that? Um, is there a you can you can talk to DOT about it. 
Okay. Yeah, I think they regulate the ones on the interstate. Okay. It used to be Charlie Fly that regulated it, but I think he turned it over to the DOT. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Anything else? Was there anything about accessory structures you wanted to share from my notes? Just to keep them. Um, it just seems like recently we've had two or three instances that I know of that um, there's been some conflict or some, maybe it's just misunderstanding by the applicant related to accessory structure without a primary resident on a agricultural type use. Um, for instance, <clears throat> I, I just think we need to revisit can you have an accessory structure on an agricultural piece of property without having a primary structure? I mean, I do think there are rare instances where, you know, where that farmer or that person may may need a you know, not not a not a small house. I'm not proposing that you know, um, but just something I wanted to, to look further in and, and and personally gain a better understanding on why on, on the reasoning. Are you talking about a shelter for a tractor and a, a little storage yeah. by it yeah. as one structure? Yeah. Is there a problem with that? It seems to be. I think we've had two or three this year that have come up. I think right now it, the way it reads is, is that what comes first is the primary structure and then the accessory structure. Yeah, I'm talking about if the guy's got 75 acres out right. and that's his farm. Right. Are you talking about that? I don't think I think you can build a pole barn, but you can't put you can't put a bathroom in it because then that triggers okay. Well, this could actually be used as a habitat or a, a, you know a dwelling or whatever. Um, but but I know of at least two cases where there were people that one was one was looking for a, a, a party house, the other one was just simply looking for a place to seek refuge from the heat in the summertime when he's out you know farming. Seek refuge from his livelihood. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the other thing was that under subdivision regulations, is that does the ULDC dictate the asphalt thickness and the requirements of infrastructure construction? The ULDC doesn't say anything about that, does it? But that's an engineering that's standard an engineering that we have standard. to. It reflects back to an engineering standard that that the engineers department. Well, I just know that it seems like in some of the newer subdivisions we're using cheaper products, less expensive products, inferior products, and and then the county's going to ultimately take it on the chin to have to go back and restrike, resign, and deal with potholes and. I hear what you're saying, uh, but I've heard it on the other side that the actual, what I've heard from developers is that the county standards for subdivision development are more stringent than GDOTs. That's what I've heard from developers. Um, so it means that they're actually trying to make sure that in those subdivisions that they are getting quality roads in there, that they are built to a higher standard than just let's call it the minimum standard, which would be GDOT. Um, so that in the event that we do end up taking those roads, when we do adopt those and take those roads over, that we do, we're, we're assured that we've got a good quality road. I think most of what I hear about is not necessarily the thickness of the asphalt, but the base and the base type that's required by the county versus what the actual uh, GDOT requirements would be, which is ASHTO, is that correct? Is that the yes. correct ac acronym? But we have had some subdivisions, I think one you've worked recently in on some drainage stuff that there was some bad base and some bad work that wasn't done. We've had to go in and repave those roads, but that was prior to the standards that are in place now. I think in some cases, and again, I'm not looking to blame, but I know there's one subdivision in particular that you and I looked at a road that was on a cultural side that had some issues of deterioration on that. I gotta be honest with you, looking at that, that was an inferior installation. Work. It wasn't inferior work, that was design. That was engineering 
on the design and the location and the elevation of that road, that's where that problem developed at. So it's difficult to say, okay, which comes first? You can put all the quality base and everything you want to, but if you put it like my yard right out in front here, it's not going to stand up very long. Right. You know, so those are issues that you have to be concerned about. So, But I agree with you. You know, if we look at those standards and see if there's some weaknesses in those standards to make sure that when we do adopt a subdivision that we're adopting it to standards that Lowndes County expects and we want to make sure we got quality roads in. But my understanding is from the developing community is that our standards for roads and subdivisions is higher than the GDOT standards. Is that fair enough to say? That's fair. Okay. So I've asked that same question. We felt like nothing was too good for the taxpayers. I hear you. <laughs> well, I mean, it, reality is, I mean, if there's a base that you know, I mean, and like I said, I'm, I come back to the base because that's where I heard the issues were. I, I think the difference between a lime base and a concrete, uh, dirt, clay, whatever the base material is, the one base cement. material that has better, that, that's going to last longer, stand up better than the other. And so that's, that really is where the only difference is. Once the, and, and really the county's standard is more expensive to put in than the, um, and he does this. I think everything else that I was that I had thought about is also in the staff comments, like on buffering and stuff. I know we like last year we had a case where there was the buffer requirements was adjacent to a wetland type area that was never going to be developed, and the requirements were putting legal in Cypress and doing all this, you know, elaborate buffering. Yeah, which was actually going to, it was, it was kind of contradictory to the intent because they were going to end up having to take out vegetation that was mature and, you know, to, to do their buffering, which didn't make sense. So, but they've got that in the staff comments. So. Thank you. Anything else? Mark, you discussed, we discussed briefly about home occupation. You got anything else you want to add to that? No. Well, the record showed the answer was no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Staff comments uh, addressing a little bit of that. Okay. That map is on the way, so we can clip it here. Oh, okay, so, good. Yeah, we'll have that here in the screen. Good. Uh -huh. Do y'all have uh, any feedback concerning? Uh, tiny house issues. Are there any tiny houses in our area? There have been discussions about them and people are expressing interest in it. I didn't know from the public or from the construction community that there was an issue. I mean, there's always discussions. You hear about them because they're very popular, tiny houses. But, um, and, and, I, and it could raise an issue and, and because mobile homes are falls under a different set of regulations than stiff built standard construction. However, most all tiny houses, a lot of them are <coughs> home built on a frame which makes it a mobile home and it's intended to be relocated if you choose to do that, but it's being it, it, it's not being built by mobile home standards, and I think that is Department of Community Affairs that, uh, is, is that right, or there's a, there's a group that basically, because they get a stamp, they get a serial number, they get all of that information, you get a title to a mobile home, I don't have a good enough understanding to know the tiny house project process about how that's done. So if, if I were going to build a tiny house today, I'm just saying, if I was going to build a tiny house today, am I required to get a permit to build that tiny house? I'm asking, am I? I, I would think yes, but for me to tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt, I don't know. Yeah. I would have and that's my point. I mean, it's mobile. I mean, I might build it here, but I might take it to Florida. 
I got it. So they are the four types of tiny homes are recreational vehicles, manufactured mobile homes, residential modeler, industrialized buildings, and site built dwellings, zoning requirements, tiny houses like all other houses and recreational vehicles are subject to zoning requirements of local government, which vary widely by jurisdiction. There's a fact sheet on DCA's website. Um, some, mobile, some tiny homes are like mobile homes, and some tiny homes are stick built. Yeah, on a permanent foundation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the ones that I've heard about, the inquiries that I've been part of, um, would have fallen under our plan development requirements. It would just be setbacks and buffering and so forth. I mean, the one that, that I'm most knowledgeable about, was just, it was just going to be a, a development that was, they were all just smaller homes. I haven't, I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything like that. Um, well, I don't think even an area was identified. I just know that Lowndes County was, was looked at closely on the north end and said, hey, can we, you know, can we purchase 150 acres and build you know, 800, 600 to 800 square feet. They're real close. <coughs> they're cute. They've got some amenities. You know, what would it take to do that? <laughs> Melson Hill. <laughs> you always have to bring up blue pool and them. <laughs> I knew we weren't going to get out of this thing without it. Well, and I think that that's maybe something that we need to do a little bit more research on is to get the clarification on really what is what the definition of a tiny home would be. Is it a certain level of square footage that it has to reach. Um, what I see is what I see on the Home and Garden Channel, which is someone takes a, tra a, a, a frame with wheels and they build it and it's portable. They can move it up and down the road, take it to the lake if they want to do it, those sort of things. That's a tiny home, tiny house. I haven't really seen any that's been featured like that that were permanently built. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, Build whatever you want to build, I guess, up to a certain amount. Of course, most developments has a minimum square foot standard that's set up for that development. You can't just go into Grove Point and say, hey, folks, I'm going to put me a tiny house over here. <laughs> the size of it and whether or not it's on wheels seems to determine the regulatory agency. Right, and that's what that. I was talking about, yeah. The regulatory agency has to do with whether it's built on wheels or not. But the issue is, Manufactured home is built under a controlled environment in a manufacturing process to where the tiny homes that I've seen that are, from a marketing standpoint, those are like hobby projects. So somebody gets a frame and then they go in there and structurally build a house on top of that frame. Under the Region Commission a couple of months ago had a person that come in and do a training and talked about that's what they do is build it. And I think one of the questions was asked, what type of zoning? And I don't think anybody here out of the 18 counties was able to answer that. So um, I thought that sure. if it was on wheels, it fell under the the like the RV park guidelines, and if it was not, it fell under a plan development. That's the way I thought. Mm -hmm. And I think that's more or less what this is saying. It it falls under residential industrialized modular buildings. If it's not on wheels, I don't know. I was uh, talking to Chris, and I was asking how you think that we need to look at putting something like that and developing something that's more zone. I would say this. I mean, there there could be a need for something <coughs> like that, but in this, in, in, right now, I would think that in Lambs County's position that we're in, you find that a lot more in the urban areas like in the city of Aldosta with some of these um, these smaller infill lots that they've got. Right now, some of those lots you can't build on them because they don't meet certain width standards. So it would make sense to me if those type communities would look and say, well, could you do a tiny home type model? and put it on that lot and still be able to obtain the proper setbacks that you'd like to see on that lot simply because it's a non-conforming lot. I mean, there's a possibility of ways on, to fill in those lots with doing this something came like up, that. This came up under the land bank, but nobody had any issues. Really? Well, I, <clears throat> I, would, I would be cautious. I, I would be cautious about it from the county standpoint 
that if someone had a small sliver of property that they just wanted to slip in a tiny built home because they can take that tiny piece of property and still meet those setback, those setback standards, would that be something that we would encourage? And by encouraging it is that you have regulations in place that allows you to do it. Then basically you're encouraging it. But it will still stand up as far as what is required for separate it just would not surprise me at all if we're not faced with that in the next year or two. I mean, because they are very popular. And, and, and not only just the, the, the tiny home community, um, it's turning more into, I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, you know, if you had $30,000, $50,000 worth of expendable money and you you know, you're looking for a getaway place or whatever. You wanted to be somewhat close to home, but you just kind of wanted to get out of your main residence or whatever. I mean, people are developing these things on, and some are even digging huge lakes, and they're putting in community pools, and they're doing all the amenities that you would find in an upscale RV park, mm -hmm. but they've got a permanent structure there that well, they leave their stuff there, and, you know, they go back and forth on the weekends or whatever, and I just find it hard to believe that we won't be faced with that. But well, those standards may be something we, that we want to look at as we move forward and when we make the decision about how we want to handle these updates on the ULDC, then that would be something that we could look at for some standards to do that. Um, is the commission um, interested in supplying to us or submitting to staff your areas of concern uh, on the ULDC, what you want to do, which sections y'all want to look at, any comments back on the staff's comments that are in here so we can begin to plan some work session meetings whereby staff is there, y'all can discuss these issues, you can get answers back and give us instructions as to what you want, when you want it, what you want it to look like. I absolutely have no objection to that. I think that's the best way to do it. If you have some issues or some things that you want to address, just as Joe said, put that in the form of information so he can incorporate it right into the staff recommendations as well, and it all be considered at one time. Uh, Y'all have <coughs> discussed uh, yesterday and today particulars about this. One of the things that came out when we began this mission was a discussion prior to the creation, what kind of community you want us to be down the road. Not just the particulars of little house, tiny house, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the general concept of where y'all want this community to be, if it is um, a reference to protection of rural agricultural timber areas, is it development uh, and the balance between those? So if we could get that type of feedback from y'all, each one will be different, I believe. But either way, it would help the commission, uh, help the staff understand the direction rather than it being the direction of the staff. I, 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 and I agree. I mean, it's going to help staff make whatever recommendations and let them focus on the issues that you would like to have addressed. But I'll also say this I think anybody that knows. I mean, this is, this is a pretty thick document, but the ULDC, no different than any other code issue, a lot of people look at it as being restrictive. It's not intended to be restrictive, it's intended to be protective. It's to protect you from your neighbors and you from your neighbors to make sure that what they're doing is the same thing that you're having to do as well. So when you look at something such as this, that it's not intended to restrict anything, 
<coughs> but it's there to protect the community as well and give the direction as how you want your community to look. You know, use that tiny house example. Without some sort of guidelines to how you would want to address that, as I said, people could start putting up tiny houses. I mean, you'd have a $300,000 home here, a million dollar home here, and a $50,000 home here. Is that the way you want your community to look, or do you need such as this to be able to guide the way that community needs to look? Again, it's not intended to be restrictive. It really is to protect other property owners in this community as well, to make sure that everybody is working to the same set of standards. And that seems to be where we get into trouble. We get into, I say trouble, we get into the discussions a lot of times with property owners is that, why am I having to do this? I've been here 40 years. Why am I having to do this? Well, you're having to do it as much as anything because it is the regulations, and number one, it is to protect you from your, or your, protect your neighbors sometimes from you and from your actions. We'll talk about, let, let's touch base back just a separate second on home, home occupations. You know, I have no problem with home occupations, and I understand the guidelines about odors and this sort of thing. But if you had an individual out there that had a blacksmithing shop, you're going to have odors, you're going to have noise, but it's only him, and he's there running a little blacksmith shop, metal shop. Is it restrictive to say that he cannot have a home occupation, that he must go out there and have his property rezoned as commercial highway, in order to put something such as a blacksmith shop on, as that example, that's that's the issues that you've got to be careful about. And I think right now with the guidelines that we have in the example of home occupation, certainly one thing's going to be could be deemed as a nuisance to the other person, but I think that folks need to have the opportunity to be able to have an own, a home occupation if that's what they want to do, but they also have to understand that their neighbor next door to them also has the right to a home occupation, as long as he's within those guidelines as well. It can't be all for one and not apply to everybody else. And that's sometimes when we get into that big gray area that, you, that we talked about, about any regulation is, is that, you know, not in my backyard. I want to do it, but I don't want you to do it. It's, it's a tough thing, and there is no there is no one model fits all, but you've got to have something that you can base up on, base your information on. And that's, again, this is not intended to be restricted. It's intended to be protected for the rest of the people in the home around the night community. Well, it's a daunting task, and they're just thinking about, like you said, just volume of the book and the things that's covered in the UODC. I mean, it can make you feel overwhelmed real quick to start thinking about you know, where do we even start at, at, at updating and revising and, and, and even just looking closely at all this. I mean, I've been trying to do it for months. And I've had it printed out and flipped through it from time to time. And again, so it, it can be overwhelming, but I mean, I think you know, maybe the answer is to is to put these things in some type of priority order and just start with a work session with the, with the staff involved and you know because there'll, there'll be a lot of things that we say you know hey I, you know, I think we should do this and then Carmela says real quick why you shouldn't do that and then we go okay uh, forgive me sorry to wait the time let's move on um, so I mean I think it's going to take a commitment from some of us and I think it's going to take a commitment from the staff and I guess it really has to be a public meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry. Yeah, so I'm totally fine with just calling it a, you know, a ULDC planning session or whatever. And Well, I, you were involved on the front end of the development of the ULDC. I was involved partially in, in, in the development of the ULDC as a community person at that time. Um, and, you know, the selling thing to me was it's a living, breathing document. It's not something that you create and then you put it on the shelf and you're done with it. You never go back and look at it again. 
It's intended to go back and to revise and adjust as we see needed in the direction we want the community to go in, or as the community changes, there's things in here that, you know, that we may deem that's not applicable. Then again, as we're talking about tiny houses, if they're not addressed in here, maybe we need to go in now and address tiny houses. Yeah. So that's, that was always, to me, uh, I, you know, I think y'all know me well enough to know that I, I'm kind of an anti-regulatory guy, but at the same time, realizing you have to have regulations. Um, so in order to do that, then when I was assured that it was a living, breathing document, we could look at it when we wanted to, make changes to it when it was needed. I said, let's get it as good as we can, and then we can always adjust when we need to. I think, yeah, and I think it's done a good job, because as Mr. Pritchard said yesterday when we were looking at this, you know, we've looked at it many times where Jason, as throughout the year, as he would see things that would need to be changed, he would have those meetings, make those recommendations, and make the changes. Then we would adopt them at a commission meeting. Even so it's been just time. what he said, what I was told that it was. Even before that time when it was first developed, there was many changes that was made during that time. Mm -hmm. Putting it, to, trying to get it together was good. I and mean, I think I rolled off the board when we were at the final meeting. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things that took time mm -hmm. and effort. It did. Well, Many meetings and many contacts. And sometimes it was very confrontational. Mm -hmm. You know, I, was, I wasn't in local government at that time. I was in the construction business. I don't mind saying working with the home builders. Mm -hmm. And again, home builders are home builders. They want to be able just to go out there and build it. Don't tell me how to do it. I'm the professional. I'll go build it. But that's not the real world. Oh, <laughs> I think the uh, standards, standards for all home occupations are very good. Okay. Um, that we just need to a little bit, but enforce these things, or you know, make sure these people are not encroaching on their neighbors mm -hmm. in any way. Smell, noise. Okay. Well, you can ask for a list of all the home-based businesses in your district, and you can start going to each and every one of them and yeah. making sure that... That wouldn't be a problem, but I'd hate to do it in your district. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And, and I understand that that code enforcement, like we talked about, is uh, separate from the fire people now. Let me, let me kind of start off. 